welcome back. Welcome back. This is our final session of this year's Cyber. Hard to believe that we've, all that we packed in three days. I want to give deep appreciation to Monica Takis on our team who pulled this together. And there were so many takeaways. The comments have been phenomenal. Don't hesitate to give us feedback. We hope to do this. We plan to do this in person. So we're pretty excited about looking towards the future. I want to thank all of our sponsors and to all of you for attending and joining us today. Before we hear from our keynote, I'd like to welcome back our friend and colleague and sponsor, David Kane. He's CEO of Ethical Intruder, and he's going to say a few words or so many takeaways. And I'm hoping David is going to wrap up and share some of his takeaways. I know I have a list, so I just can't thank you all enough for being such great supporters of the work that we do to try to launch this region forward and to have some of the, the amazing conversations that we had over the last three days. And hopefully you met some new people, even though it's virtual, hopefully you had an opportunity to see this incredible community that we have here and some of the friends that we've welcomed. So David, I'd like to pass the baton to you and uh, appreciate all that you've done and maybe give us some takeaways. All right, thanks, Audrey. So um, I, I, I don't know if I have as much uh, as specific only because as I hope most of you thought, this was really just such a tremendous three days and there's so much that it's hard to cover everything. There's so much has changed um, over the last year and Pittsburgh just really continues to be a tremendous place to focus so deeply on cyber and on community and, and on collaboration. And so when I think back on, on the event, I think the, the panels and um, how uh, honest everybody was and how everybody worked together was, was simply just amazing. So many new things happening. And um, I think the big takeaway that I, that I wanna leave everybody with is that um, it's such a collaborative uh, group here in Pittsburgh. Please reach out to others that you have met, um, you know, other people that were on the panel. I think we all do better when we, when we work together. Um, so super excited to see everybody back together here pretty soon. But again, my big takeaway was just, just so many great topics and, um, you know, the collaborative and the community spirit is just amazing here in Pittsburgh. Thank you for Tech Council and, and Monica and Taylor and everybody else. Um, so with that, at this time, we're going to go ahead and welcome John Wetzel from Recorded Future. Um, they are the sponsor of the keynote address. He will introduce our closing keynote. And again, thank you all so much for attending. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the closing keynote for Cyber 2021. Um, in uh, case you didn't know who I am, I'm John Wetzel. I'm a senior manager at Recorded Future. Uh, and we're just one of the best intelligence companies in the world. Uh, if you uh, want to find out more, uh, you can visit our website at recordedfuture.com. Ping me uh, at uh, community at recordedfuture.com or uh, we'll just have a chat. It can be about intelligence. It can not be about intelligence. I also like wine. So I'm really pleased to introduce Mr. Greg Tuhill. He's the director of the Software Engineering Institute at, uh, for a certain division. And uh, he leads a diverse group of researchers, software engineers, security analysts, and digital intelligence specialists working together to research security vulnerabilities in software products, contribute to long-term changes in network systems, and develop cutting edge information and training to improve the practice of cybersecurity. Uh, Mr. Tuhill is a 30 year veteran of the US Air Force. Thank you for your service. And was appointed by former President Barack Obama to be the first chief information security officer of the United States government. Previously, he served in the Department of Homeland Security as a deputy assistant secretary in the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. Before joining the Software Engineering Institute, he was president of AppGate Federal, a provider of cybersecurity products and services to civilian government and defense agencies. He's a member of many organizational boards and committees, a recipient of many awards. Mr. Tuhill was recognized by Security Magazine as one of its most influential people in security and by uh, Federal Computer Week in Federal 100. He is the co-author of books, Cybersecurity for Executives, A Practical Guide, and 
commercialization of innovative technologies. Let's uh, all pay attention. I know I will be. And um, Mr. Tuhill, thank you very much. Well, thank you, John and uh, Audrey and uh, team. Thanks so much for uh, having me join this year's edition of, uh, of the Pittsburgh Technology Council's Conclave on Cybersecurity. Um, it's really been an exciting uh, three days and congratulations to the team for putting together such a great conference. Uh, you know, if we were all together, I would ask for applause for you all and have you stand, uh, so, but we're not gonna be able to do that uh, quite the same way today, but I look forward to next year's uh, where we can uh, do that. You know, one of the things that I was uh, looking at in preparing for this uh, engagement was, uh, you know, to do a, a discussion on some of the things that uh, I'm seeing in the technology. But I think, you know, during the course of this week, you've covered some great ground. Uh, and, you know, like the three rivers of our uh, Pittsburgh, you know, cybersecurity is about three things. It's about people, process, and technology. And the successful cybersecurity programs are those that are able to fuse all three and come together to produce uh, uh, results that are effective, efficient, and secure. So rather than give a, you know, a kind of stodgy old brief from a former senior government official, a retired uh, Air Force general, you know, I wanted to give the audience a, a audience par uh, participation opportunity. So I, I'd like a, a raise of hands, and I know you can do on the reactions, you can do a raise of hands. Who wants to hear a briefing um, that is just a cookie cutter, boring government official type of uh, recap of the week's events? Or would you prefer something completely different? I'm gonna give you an option. The boring one or cyber lessons from Star Trek, which are universal and can help you as you're trying to educate your workforce. If you want the Star Trek one, Raise your hand um, in the reactions. Okay, I'm even getting applause uh, uh, reactions from uh, uh, Rex Johnson there. So I'll take that as yes. Well, just panning through, I'm not seeing a whole lot of folks who want that stodgy government one, uh, but there are some folks who, you know, I'm going to I'm going to disappoint you because I think the majority that I'm seeing right now have gone for the Star Trek brief. So as uh, you can lower your hands now, thank you very much. Uh, you know, as we take a look at that people process and technology, all too often we get target fixation on the technology itself because it's really cool. It's something we can often lay our hands on. But the really hard parts of cybersecurity have continued to be the people and the process portions. And as we take a look at workforce development, it's not just the cyber technologist that we need to worry about from a workforce development standpoint. I would argue that anybody who lays hands on keyboards are part of that cyber ecosystem. And we need to be thinking about workforce development through the eyes of the entire spectrum of the workforce. Because here in the United States, uh, as well as in most places around the world, everybody is now part of that cyber ecosystem and everybody uh, should be considered part of that cyber workforce. And as somebody who was kind of on the ground floor for some of those activities in government and the military and in industry, you know, a lot of folks have asked me, you know, a lot of my students at Carnegie Mellon have asked me, well, hey, how do you, how, how can we uh, tell folks how to do things the right way at the right time? And uh, I, I say, you know what, use exemplars. And uh, when I was the commander of the Air Force's cyber training programs, we used exemplars and hands-on training as much as we could but you gotta make it personal. And today I'm gonna to show you how I learned about some of the cybersecurity lessons that helped make me successful through my career. And it was during the afternoons after school where I would, uh, while I was having my snack and doing my homework, I'd turn on channel 53 and I would, uh, uh, 
I, I would go and watch Star Trek. So let me see if I can share my screen here. And uh, Audrey, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So I will tell you that uh, as you take a look at putting together the training of your workforce, you want to make sure that you are, in fact, doing the right things the right way and at the right time. And am I showing presentation mode or uh, can you see the, the preview pane? I can see. No, you're in, you're in slide mode. Okay, perfect. So um, I want to, uh, first of all, start with a disclaimer on my slide here that um, everything about the Star Trek briefing here, I, I acknowledge that Star Trek franchise is in fact a property of Paramount Pictures. I'm sure that any uh, lawyers in the audience will appreciate that, and especially if you're an employee of Paramount Pictures. I will uh, advise that uh, the views expressed today in this briefing are mine and mine alone. I will also confirm that nobody from Star Trek in the Star Trek universe ever has consulted or asked me to contribute to the creation, production, editing, or any advertisement of the television series or movies, but you know, I wish they had. And uh, no, uh, for Matt, uh, I do not own a Starfleet uniform or tricorder, but my kids did give me a communicator that's Wi-Fi enabled for Christmas. So with that, uh, one of the lessons that uh, are in the Star Trek universe is you have to learn why things work on a starship. Uh, Admiral James T. Kirk in Wrath of Khan was able to defeat Khan because he knew how the Enterprise worked better than Khan did. And we find that adversaries often know how network enterprises work and are configured better than the folks who actually own and operate them. So it's very important that we understand how things are put together and how things work. And if you are in the defense as opposed to the offense, you need to be able to outthink and outact the offense. And you can't do that if you don't know how things work. I will also tell you that I have found throughout my professional career that complexity remains the bane of security. And in Star Trek III, the search for Spock, Scotty was able to defeat the brand new starship Excelsior because they had made it so complex that he was able to tamper with it as an insider threat. And when asked by Dr. McCoy how he was able to defeat that exquisite machine, the new Excelsior, Scotty said, the more they overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain. Complexity continues to kill us. And it's not only harmful to the end user, but it's also crushing a lot of our folks in the server rooms. And uh, throughout the enterprise, the more complex your enterprise is, the easier it is to break it. So as we are designing systems, as we are architecting, as we are coding, simplicity actually provides better security 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the time. I will also share my view that the traditional IT security per perimeter is dead. You know, that hard outer shell of uh, firewalls, we puncture it so many times with virtual private networks. We've got mobility, cell phones, uh, laptops, now massive work from anywhere with 5G enablement. Um, that traditional IT security perimeter, the castle moat model, that's been overcome by other technologies. And we need to be prepared to say, you know what, there are no perimeters anymore except for the individuals themselves. We need to be enforcing least privilege such that Greg can only see what Greg is authorized to see and nothing else. And oh, by the way, if you look at this particular uh, image, you'll see that um, the folks at Star Trek, the crew, they were already using mobile computing. 
So Bones has got his tricorder there along with the uh, lieutenant. And of course, Sulu's got his. They've also got their communicators and Kirk has got his open. So back in 1967, this was mobile computing, forecasting what we've had today. How secure was it? Maybe even more secure than some of the stuff we have out today. Another lesson from Star Trek that folks are not following despite the fact that we tell them to is change the default password. When I was uh, the director of the National Cyber Security and Communications Integration Center, we did a study where we actually had uh, a researcher do a Shodan scan of the, uh, the universe looking for out of the box installed uh, hardware that hadn't changed its default password. We were targeting industrial control systems. And we literally found over 200 million devices in the United States alone that folks had taken the unit out of the box, plugged it in, but didn't change the default password. Now, I will tell you in fairness to some of them that sometimes folks in the manufacturing community manufacture it with a static default password and don't give you the opportunity to change the password. That's a big mistake and that increases our risk. But when you take something out of the box and you don't change that password, you increase your risk. Kirk knew that in the Wrath of Khan uh, movie and he was able to have Spock look up that default password, which was 16309 and they were able to hack into the uh, USS Reliant, drop the shields, have uh, Kirk's crew fire their last two uh, phaser shots so that they could live and fight another day. So don't be like Khan, change your default password. But if you do have to have a password, make sure it's sufficiently complex. And there was uh, an episode in season four of Star Trek The Next Generation where data created a password so that his brother, Lore, could not hack into the enterprise and take control of it. This was the password that, uh, that Data put together. And in that, uh, he had you know, uh, random numbers, he had a string here. How secure is that password? Well, I plugged it into how secure is my password.net and I found that it would take about one followed by 63 zeros of uh, years in order to break that password. Now, do we expect everybody here to put together really long passwords like Data did? Heck no. You know, but you can put some passphrases and some other things that are sufficiently uh, complex so that you can in fact protect your data. I think passwords uh, should be complex, but not overly complex. Remember what I said, simplicity is one of the keys to security. And I talked about enforcing least privilege. And when we see um, Star Trek, once again, the Wrath of Khan movie, Kirk was able to beat the Kobayashi Maru test when he was a cadet at Starfleet Academy. What is a cadet doing gaining access to one of the principal training environments at, at the academy. He should never have been authorized that. He was able to get in because they were not enforcing least privilege. You should, as part of your security strategy, you should be making sure that you only authorize access to those who have a need to know and under the conditions that they should have before granting access. Starfleet Academy has a lot to learn in the future about following and enforcing least privilege. We should also broaden our aperture. Uh, we've, during the course of this conference, we've talked a lot about inf uh, information technology, and some folks have been touching on the importance of operational technology, industrial control systems, SCADA, IoT non-traditional uh, IT stuff, and I think that's great. And during Star Trek Generations, the first Next Generation movie, we saw an instance where uh, we had a hack into Geordi's visor. The chief engineer was kidnapped, 
His uh, visor was hacked into by the Klingons and uh, Malcolm McDowell's character. And as a result, Jordy's visor was hacked into. They were able to see what he saw. They put him back on the Enterprise. They saw what the frequency of the shields were. They were able to adapt their weapons to fire through the shields and the Enterprise was lost. Do you want your Enterprise to be lost because somebody got into your operational technology, your ICS, your SCADA, or an IoT device? I think not. So you need to broaden your aperture as to what your risk exposure is and how to protect it. Also from Star Trek, I learned that every computer can be hacked, every single one, and every code broken. I was also amazed and continue to be amazed that in Star Trek, the crew of the Star Trek Enterprise could sit down at any computer terminal and automatically be able to operate it. Go figure. But if you think about it, we have some really exquisite capabilities and there's no such thing as a computer that can't be hacked. What we have to do is this, we have to manage cybersecurity as a risk exercise. And those who expect risk to be zero are gonna be woefully disappointed. Here in this episode, the Paradise Syndrome, the only one where Kirk was married to the lovely Miriamani, Spock spent 60 days figuring out that the symbols uh, on the glyph turned out to be musical notes. And he was able to figure out the language of the anti-meteor, anti-collision system. And he, Spock saved the day because he was able to hack into that particular computer. Don't plan on your computer being bulletproof. Architect such that you can take a punch and keep on going. Also, know your software provenance. Know where it came from. In Star Trek Deep Space Nine, uh, called Civil Defense, the Deep Space Nine itself, the code on it was created by the dreaded Cardassians, not the Kardashians, the Cardassians. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Goldicott, one of the Cardassians. Um, they actually, the, the Federation crew actually had to bring the Cardassians, who were adversaries, back in to help patch the code because it was threatening the lives of the chief engineer of the station. Most folks don't know what their software provenance is, where it came from. They don't know what the components of their software is. In the federal government now, there's a huge move forward to require a software bill of materials. I think that's actually a good thing, but we're gonna keep an eye on that. And we at Carnegie Mellon are contributing to the discussion on that. And I hope that you will too, is uh, making sure that we are encouraging manufacturers to include software bills of material so that you can in fact see what's in your code, who created it, how old it is. And then further in the event that something bad happens, it speeds up the forensics capabilities. Also from a risk standpoint, recognize that you need to plan ahead when you do an update or an upgrade. Uh, Patch Tuesday should not send quivers and quakes throughout your organization because, oh my gosh, I'm not sure if I put this patch in, if it's going to kill my system or not. Um, but you have to plan that maybe not every upgrade will go well. Like many of you, I have had that great uh, Patch Tuesday experience where I went and applied patches and they, it did not go well. I had to have a back out plan. And Star Trek uh, The Next Generation season one, they had a not so good uh, backup uh, situation where they had an upgrade to these Enterprise D's computers. And actually there was a little bit of an inside threat there. So uh, a great lesson from Star Trek that you should plan for when you're doing software upgrades that maybe it won't go well. So is, that's a, a business case thing where maybe you wanna have a test environment that parallels your actual operational enterprise. Whoop, I accidentally skipped. This one's important too. Securely back up your vital data. Spock backed up his Katra, his, uh, his um, memories and soul as it were, 
to McCoy before he went and saved the enterprise at the end of Wrath of Khan. We're in the middle of a ransomware epidemic where we have a lot of folks that are going and um, uh, cyber criminals are planting ransomware. They're waiting for it to promulgate through your backup cycles and then launch the ransomware and lock uh, you down. And well, many organizations are paying big bucks in order to unlock their data. We're in essence paying extortionists off just for business continuity purposes. I, I, we've got to break that cycle. And one of the ways we can do that is rethinking how we are backing up our data and making sure in fact that uh, we are trying to break that ransomware cycle. This is something we need to keep our eye on. This is a contemporary issue and it is a risk management issue that should be looked at from the board on down. We also should recognize that folks want access to your information because your information creates knowledge and knowledge equals profit. We see a lot of folks uh, not really understand the value of their data and your data has value. It costs you a lot of time, effort, money, personnel costs, everything to create it, store it, manipulate it, manage it, archive it, retrieve it. Your data has value. And uh, we saw in the Office of Personnel Management that we had some government employees who looked at their data as low value uh, information. It was considered unclassified and they didn't necessarily take into account the strategic value of that data. Take a good look at your data and recognize that your data creates information which creates knowledge which creates profit to others. Something that may be insignificant to you could be of great value to adversaries. Be aware. Also, Star Trek taught me artificial intelligence isn't always good. We need to be very cautious when it comes to artificial intelligence so that we in fact are protecting our civil rights, civil liberties, privacy and such. And it, you can go through every particular series of enterprise uh, and Star Trek and see examples of where machines got out of control. So as we go into this next phase of, or this next generation in our cybersecurity journey, we've got to be very cautious about uh, artificial intelligence and build security in from the beginning. And uh, you know, with our team at Carnegie Mellon and the uh, Software Engineering Institute, when we're working for our research and in, with, in conjunction with our government uh, partners, we're making sure that security by design is built into the artificial intelligence continuum. Because ultimately, computers make excellent and efficient servants, but I personally don't have any wish to serve underneath them, just like Spock. And I hope you don't either. So as we uh, look at secure by design, Star Trek definitely was leading the way. And we also learned uh, in the most recent Star Trek Beyond uh, movie, a, a great reminder that adversaries change and so should we. Um, just because folks were doing uh, fishing 10 years ago, it doesn't mean that they're gonna continue to just do fishing. The adversaries are doing all sorts of different types of ways to gain access to your data. So you need to be prepared for that. And you need to always be understanding your uh, adversaries. And there's great companies out there like Recorded Future that uh, can help along the way. But you know what? You build the team so that you better understand the adversaries. You build the team of professionals and you harden your workforce. And you make sure that your processes are continually assessed and refined to defeat the adversaries. And don't be afraid to try new technologies. And here we have Admiral Kirk beta testing several new uh, Starfleet designs. There are three in this particular image. He's got a brand new um, smart watch that he's uh, uh, beta testing for Starfleet. He's beta testing a new uniform, which did not survive the movie. And then, uh, you know, the snarky part of me says uh, there, there he's testing a new hair design too. But don't 
Don't be averse to testing new technologies, but do it in a very deliberate and fulsome way and fail fast. If something is, is not meeting your needs, get rid of it. Also, make sure your training never stops. Uh, as you take a look at some folks, and I see it in uh, the highest levels where we've got folks who've got PhDs and you know they've hit the, the apex of the educational pyramid. You know what? They, they're the types of folks who are continually investing in training and education. They are looking uh, to uh, be even better, and so should we all. So in uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, Jordi Laforge, chief engineer of the enterprise, he ran into a problem. He created a holodeck training program uh, with Dr. Leah Brahms to try to help him work through this really tough problem. Your training never stops. I also learned from Star Trek to pay attention to quantum. There's been a lot of discussion on quantum computing, quantum encryption. You know, let's continue to pay attention to this and we should learn more. It's critically important to um, where the future of cybersecurity is going, as well as uh, how we uh, introduce new technical advances into our culture and our society. And when it comes to workforce, make sure that you are investing in having succession plans because the cybersecurity workforce is very dynamic. People are moving all the time. And after they finish this, uh, a certain challenge, they're looking for the next challenge. And that may not be in your organization. So you should be working your succession uh, plan all the time. And that includes upskilling and reskilling within your own ranks. So we've talked during the conference on a lot of workforce stuff. Succession planning should be part of your agenda if you're a leader. Also, from Star Trek, uh, we learned that trust is presumed yet misplaced. In uh, the episode titled Court Martial, Kirk, Kirk was court martialed because uh, he supposedly made a mistake, jettisoned a pod where Commander Finney, Lieutenant Commander Finney, who was the data officer on board, uh, he was the only computer systems officer ever in the identified in the Star Trek universe. Finney actually wasn't in the pod. He, he hacked into the computer. He had the keys to the kingdom and tampered with it as an insider. So as a result, I learned that you shouldn't necessarily trust everybody. You should have, in fact, the controls out there and you should adopt the zero trust security model because even the captain of the enterprise could turn into an adversary. So that's really where I suggest and highly recommend you adopt the zero trust security model. And it's a, it's a strategy, it's not a thing. It's not a technology. It's about people, process and technology. That's where zero trust all comes together. And I can meet with you offline if you wanna learn more about that. This is one of my specialties. Finally, my last two slides. Let's remember that it's not the size of the enterprise itself that defines success. It's the leaders and the crews that do. And as you take a look at your enterprise, don't be deterred by the size. Don't be impressed by it either. Because at the end of the day, it's the leaders and the crews who have to exercise the mission well. And doing something different can be good. And uh, one of the great things about Star Trek and the enterprise itself is that there's hope for a better tomorrow. And I think that as we conclude this con uh, conference, there's plenty of hope for a better tomorrow. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us uh, in this conference. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Greg. Let's see if there are any questions. Someone made a comment. That's a picture of Quark who was never on Voyager. Well, um, <laughs> I, I, did I put on there that he was in Voyager? Uh, because uh, actually Armin uh, appeared in multiple iterations of uh, Ferengi. 
um, in not only Deep Space Nine, but he was also in Next Generation. Um, and, and I don't know if he was in Voyager or not, but in any case, uh, point well taken. The Cork was a key, key uh, uh, cast member for Deep Space Nine. Well, good. It seems it seems like there's not many questions. Would love your presentation. Love that you're coming. That you're in route back to Pittsburgh. And you did make it interesting, as Mike Miller just said. Thank you. It's, uh, it'll be very wonderful to meet you in person and, and connect. So I think that I'm going to, first of all, thank you, Greg. Safe travels and your return to Pittsburgh. May you find a moving van in these days yes, and uh, stay safe. Really appreciate, look forward to your leadership over at CERT. And David, I'm going to pass the baton back to you, I think. Correct. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Audrey. And, and thank you again so much, Greg. That was great. So uh, one of the things that, that Greg mentioned uh, a few times was the concept of people, process, and technology. And that was actually the, the theme of the very first Cyborg. And really something that, that continues to, to resonate. I mean, it's sort of sticking with the basics, um, but if you really focus on your people and your process and, and your technologies, I think you're gonna think, think you're gonna do really well. So that actually wraps it up this year for Cyborg. Again, I just wanna really thank all of the attendees, thank all of the tremendous panelists, um, thank all of the, the vendors, thank the Technology Council, um, and thank you for, for showing up and for being here. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you in 2022 in person. And with that, that concludes uh, Cyborg for this year. Thank you, everybody.